Good morning, sir. Can I help you? Half past 11. If it doesn't rain, yeah. It's my hearing aid repaired. <laughs> what? Is my hearing aid repaired? Well, normally at five o'clock, but we'll close early today. That sounds like mine. Yeah. <laughs> Not much point in hanging around. You see, my hearing aid hasn't come back from the repairers yet. No, I can't remember you giving me a receipt. Yeah. <laughs> Been here all day. I've done a bit of business. Just as well stayed at home. Yeah, that sounds like it. Clip on ivory one with the built-in battery. Oh, they come in all right, one after the other, but there's no action, no action. That's at right, all, no. that's right, yes, with a gold pendant. Oh, I should have gone into pig farming. Yes, yes. And inscribed from all the survivors in Blasting Team 4. <laughs> You said the doohickey connecting the doodad with the grommet needed replacing. Well, of course, I could have stayed in the artillery. They asked me to stay, you know. A simple job, you said. Yeah, they asked me to stay. So I discovered later. Oh, uh, yes, madam? Oh, it's a lovely day. Oh, uh, normally at five o'clock. Oh, is my hearing aid back from the repairer? Except holiday weekends and Christmas. It's a sentimental value, really. Oh, good. Then I can use my credit card. But why I hang around here all these hours, I don't know. No one wants anything, you know. There's my hearing aid back from the repairers. Yes, it's early closing today. Yes. You've got a good business going here. Lots of traffic. Oh, you're right. I will be glad to get it back. Well, president of a large grocery chain that isn't Safeway or Mr. Grocer. <laughs> I have a new publication for those of you out there who like food. It's called The Outsider's Report. <laughs> the Outsider's Report is full of products that will spice up any dysfunctional dinner party. For instance, here's a favorite of mine, my dead Uncle Larry's fruit salad. <laughs> It contains over two kinds of fruit. <laughs> one of which has hair on it. <laughs> There's also my brother Pete's all groundhog meatloaf. <laughs> and my Aunt Sophie's memories of Nepean lemonade. <laughs> kinds of wonderful products in the Outsider's Report. Products like tuxedo crackers. Every cracker comes dressed in a designer tuxedo and is wrapped in a cummerbund. <laughs> Ladies, it will remind you of your honeymoon but without the dip. <laughs> You've heard of my decadent chocolate chip cookies? Well, now I've made them even more decadent. They're called Yule Rot in Hell Chocolate Chip Cookies. <laughs> While you're in our stores, be sure to visit our bulk meat bin.
meat is so fresh, you'll swear you see it move. <laughs> Just before you have to club it. <laughs> and don't forget to pick up a bag of gourmet kitty litter. It's so fragrant, you'll want to squat in it yourself. <laughs> Insiders report for all your shopping needs. We even have a generic drug section. This week's feature for that special manic depressive in your life. <laughs> it's I can't believe it's not lithium. <laughs> this is Dave, the grocery guy, reminding you if you can't get these Outsiders products at your grocery store, let me know and I'll have my friend Bruno go to that store and rearrange the manager's shelves. <laughs> and if you're ever in the area, drop into my store and say hello. You can find me in the fruitcake section. <laughs> You wanted to see me, Mr. Clapman? My name is Chapman, not Clapman. Oh, sorry, boss. Look, how long have you been a typesetter for this paper, Ridgely? Oh, I've been here for uh, six weeks. <laughs> you mean six weeks? Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. Six weeks ago, well, you personally handed me my first chick. Uh, I mean, check. Ridgely, your spelling mistakes and general screw-ups in the typesetting room has caused this newspaper a lot of embarrassment. Well, no one is perfect, Mr. Clapman. It's Chapman. How many times must I tell you? Well, so I made an occasional mistake. Occasional mistake? That's the understatement of the century. That's like saying the Black Plague was a minor discomfort. Ridgely, look at yesterday's newspaper. Would you take a look? You're responsible for this ad. This week only at Jiffy Car Wash for $3 have your car cleaned, polished, and sodomized. <laughs> well, Ridgely, what do you have to say? I wouldn't take my car there. <laughs> Not even for two dollars. We had to publish an apology, Ridgely, in today's edition. Oh, well, as long as it's all cleared up. Well, you set the type. Here, you read it. Oh. Uh, we apologize for causing Jiffy Car Wash any embarrassment. We hope it will happen again. You left out a word, Ridgely. Yeah, well, it wouldn't all fit on one line, Mr. Claptrap. <laughs> to air is human. That makes you the most human person on earth, doesn't it? And this weather report, it should have read foggy tonight. Well, I was close. Close? Well, Mr. Craftsman, all newspapers have mistakes now and again. Now and again, yes, Ridgely, but not every day. Look at this classified. Wanted personnel to work as real estate agents. No intelligence necessary. <laughs> well, maybe in that case, that's, uh, that's allowable. I see nothing wrong with that. You well, know. I'm sorry if I caused embarrassment to the newspaper. Embarrassment, Ridgely? The Morning Sun has been a reputable newspaper for 87 years. Yesterday, you changed its name to The Morning Sin. <laughs> Ridgely, you are an incompetent idiot, a dummy, a moronic imbecile. I have only one thing to say to you, and that is... Mr. Chapman, good news, our circulation has just tripled. Keep up the good work, Ridgely. <laughs> Hello, I'm Wilfred Brimley, movie actor and cereal salesman. If you're like me, you like to take care of yourself. 
And that includes starting the day off with a healthy bowl of new oat bran and lobster cereal. <laughs> mm, that's right, oat bran and lobster. It combines the wholesome nutrition of oat bran with the delicious taste of a dead lobster. Mm, mm, good. Now, would I say that if they weren't paying me? I doubt it. <laughs> there are two scoops of lobster claws in every box of oat bran and lobster. Watch, let's pour a bowl. Oh, jeepers, that one's still alive. That'll teach the little bugger. You know, nutrition experts say that one bowl full of oat bran and lobster contains the maximum daily requirement of riboflavin, niacin, and crustacean. Whoa. When I heard that, I almost dropped a load right then and there. <laughs> oat bran and lobster. You just add milk and butter sauce. And you know it's completely cholesterol free. Well, except for the milk and the butter sauce. <laughs> so go ahead, dig in and enjoy. Mm. Mm. Oat bran and lobster. Oh, yeah. Always stays crunchy. No matter how wet it gets. <laughs> oh, so much for that. And remember, there's lobster in it, so when you chew, keep your trap shut. <laughs> Oat bran and lobster. It's just as nutritious as a breakfast of fried eggs, bacon, coffee, and a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> so take my advice and go for it. One bowl full daily. Oh, and you'll be more regular than a bean-fed moose. <laughs> well, it's starting to work now, so excuse me, I gotta go. <laughs> Oat bran and lobster, it's the right thing to do. Gerald! Gerald! Oh, don't shout, Nigel. I'm undergoing a trauma. <sighs> Gerald, don't talk to me of trauma. The poetry magazine went bust today, and I'm out of a job. Oh, no, not you, too. Yes. The CBC just canceled my program. I leave there on Wednesday. No. Yeah. They haven't canceled literary trends in the Northwest Territories. Yes. <laughs> I'm afraid they have. Oh, so, Gerald, we're both out of work. We'll just have to live off Digby until something turns up. Mm. Oh, woe is me, woe is me. Well, what is what it? Is what, it? Is what, is it? what is it? What's the matter, Digby? What's the matter, Digby? Je suis distrait. <laughs> Je suis absolument floored. <laughs> I've been laid off. Oh, what? No, oh, that's not you too, Absolutely. Digby. Come, 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 come. No one gets laid off from the Canada Council. <laughs> well, I suppose all I can do is live off you guys until something else turns up. Oh, oh well, uh... Gerald and I were hoping to live off you, Digby. Yes, Nigel and Lana, I were both laid off today. Yes. What? All three of us? Mm, off. What is this, a putsch against the literary set? Without us, there'd be nobody to tell the public about Canadian culture. Yes. And if they didn't know about it, it would cease to exist. <laughs> Honestly, I feel so mad about this, I want to hit back at society. Oh, yes, so do I. I could just spit. <laughs> you no. Know, you know what I feel like doing? I want to toss off an ode that would really hurt them. No, no, Nigel. No, we need to do something much more dramatic. Rob a bank. What? what? Rob a bank? Come on, Digby, it's just not us. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Nigel, I think Digby's right. Let's rob a bank. We've got all we need right here. My Volvo is the getaway car. Yes. We can carve a gun out of soap. Oh, I'd like to yes. do that. Ooh. I've always felt that sculpting was my metier. Yeah. So let's go. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. We need a note. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah, look, I have a pencil and paper. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. This is a stick-up. Hold it right there, Gerald. I've always found stick-up to be so <laughs> demi-monde as a phrase. <laughs> it's sort of godfather pasta tacky, if you know what I mean. Yes, Nigel, I get your point. I yes. knew you would. Well, uh, hold up then. This is a hold up. Hmm. 
Well, you can't say this is, can you, Gerald? Because when you hand over the note, the use of the present tense presumes something is already in progress when palpably it is not. Digby's absolutely right. Well, what do you suggest? Um, well, let me see. Mm, let me um, see now. Um, a holdup is about to commence. Oh, no, 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 the act, the, the act usually begins with the note. Mm. A holdup is commencing. Mm, I, don't I don't know. know. Iffy. Iffy, isn't I mean, it? surely uh, not. Is commencing. That's mm. use of the present continuous tense, which presumes an act that can continue for some time. You can't keep commencing, can you? All right. You? I mean, right. commence, commence, commence. All right, all right, all right, all right. A holdup commences. Oh, oh that's I wonderful. Love it. Yeah. Oh, I love it, I love it. Oh, I love it. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. write it down, write it down. Hold up, love commences. It. Yes. Take this uh, down, Gerald. Say nothing to no one. Anyone. No, anyone. Of course. Say nothing uh, to anyone. Uh, wait a minute, yes. wait a minute. How can you say nothing to someone? You can't. Well, therefore, can't. reductio ad absurdum, you can't say nothing to anyone. Yeah, Nigel's right. Mm. Oh, yes. Uh, all right. Do not say anything. Nice. Mm -hmm. Much cleaner, Gerald. Yes. yes, catches the essence much better. There is one point. Isn't there just a smidgen, just an implicatory hint of the hidden imperative in there? Uh, Do not say anything. Ergo, say something. Mm. Mm. Yes. Mm. Uh, mm. Oh, uh, how about speak not? Mm. Love, love it. Love it. Love, 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 love it. Love it. Mm. Mm. Write it in. Ooh, Write it in. Not. All right. Like that. Mm. All right. Mm. A hold up commences. Yes. Speak not. Mm -hmm. Stick the money in the bag. No, oh. no, 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 no. Ooh. Ooh. Stick. No, it, oh, uh, insert. Better. Oh, uh, deposit. Wonderful. Wonderful. Mm. Wonderful. Yeah, deposit your money. Oh, well, uh, Gerald, we don't want the teller's money. We want the bank's yes. money. Oh, yeah, D deposit some money. I see uh, some small, specific sum of his own choosing. Uh, all right. Or all right. her own choosing. Deposit money. Right, right. Deposit money in this bag. Mm -hmm. That's Very it. Nice. That's good. Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. I'm sorry. This is open to semantic interpretation. It can also sound like there's money in the bag which Gerald wants to deposit. Deposit money in this bag. Hmm. Oh. Uh. <laughs> good point. Good point. All right. I, I didn't see that. All right. I missed that. Uh, <laughs> Phil. Fill this bag with money. Perfect. Perfect. Mm. Perfect. Uh, so that's it. A hold up commences. Speak not. Fill this bag with money. Brief and stylish. And to the point, with yes. just a hint, may I say, of understated bravura. And just a final line. That's all we need to show that we're serious about this. Yes, yes of course. Of course. Mm -hmm. A hold up commences. <laughs> Speak not. Fill this bag with money, or I'll blow your sons of itching brains out. Stuck <laughs> 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 Now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first in the Rotary Club series of lectures on saving the environment. Our scheduled speaker, Spiro Bordelow, is unable to be with us as he is hosting his annual rainforest bonfire and condor barbecue. <laughs> and uh, so we've been very lucky to uh, get the visiting professor from the Welsh Institute for the Investigation of Weird Things. His name is Professor Nguyen Aphazard. And, uh, of course, I think we all know that he's famous for his movement to ban pygmies from driving because they can't see over the dashboard. <laughs> so, uh, fellow and sister Rotarians, Professor Abhazard. Hello. Every day, planet Earth loses six species of animals. We must act now to preserve endangered species so in the future our grandchildren will have something to hunt and stuff. <laughs> Creatures like the peregrine falcon and the common and North American grizzly bunny. <laughs> Who would have thought those two would have crossed, eh? forget one of nature's most magnificent creatures. <coughs> the Algoma whooping duck. <laughs> Many with a patch on their wing. <laughs> if we do not act now, we could even lose these cute little animals.
the Turkish whistling carpenter ants. <laughs> there are so many endangered species. Species like the Samoan electric tree lizard. <laughs> if you hold its back legs and find the switch, you can shave with it. <laughs> the Northern Ontario mountain lobster. <laughs> and the close cousin of the praying mantis, the Jewish guilt-ridden mantis. <laughs> And let us not forget this rare and seldom seen animal. <laughs> the Kenyan bowling goat. <laughs> Believe it or not, all these creatures are endangered, including the Belgian lava toad which can lose one half of its body weight simply by sweating through its bum. <laughs> Much like the Welsh rugby team. <laughs> I will conclude today's lecture by introducing you to the rarest creature of all, my pet, the Bengal sperm beetle. In fact, he is the only one left in the entire world. Now, where did I put it? It's here, it's here somewhere, I know it's here. Concludes my lecture for today. <laughs> hello, hello, come in, come in, come in. Hello, welcome, welcome, Mr. Welcome, Mrs. to Borsokian Village Restaurant. Welcome, yeah. Oh, here we are. Lovely table. Good, good. Have a nice seat at table. Here are the uh, menus. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, shall we order wine, Gregory? Maybe you don't want to suggest our house wine. It's Nouf de Borsocchio Surprise. Oh, I've never heard of it. Oh, it's very nice, very nice. Rare Borsocchian nectar made from the peelings of the pomegranate and mixed with the yogurt and mineral water. Oh, delicious. Very nice, very nice. Uh, is it red or white? Uh, today it's more red than white. <laughs> it goes very, very nice with the bravnets. Bravnets? Yeah, very nice, eh? The traditional dish of native Barsokio. Mm, made from tender goat livers and fish eggs and smothered in a succulent sauce of bull's lard. Very uh, nice. Oh, no, uh, no, no. Okay, I don't perhaps think so. you prefer Barsokian corn sludge. Mm, very nice. Very similar to pate, only we use the bats instead of the goose. Also included is the soup of the month. Very nice, very nice. Uh, what is the soup? Today, actually, it is more red than white. <laughs> Fine. I think I'll try the horn sludge then, without the soup. Very nice. Um, I'll have some uh, burnstick fraulau. Oh, with or without the hat? What? With or without the hat. You just ordered our chef on a stick. <laughs> uh, you know, that is his signature. I see. Yes. Like, just, um, just bring me a, a simple Borsokian salad. Simple Borsokian Oh, sorry, no simple Borsokian salad today. We have trouble getting it lit. We are all out of kerosene. <laughs> Why don't you try the tallow torque bum? Very tasty, very nice, very tasty. Fine, tallow torque bum. Fine, that'll be just fine. Okay. Oh, listen. Oh, there's Hugel Farm. Oh, you are in luck, my friends. The floor show is about to begin. <clears throat> and now, ladies and gentlemen, our world famous Borsokian choir. He will sing a lovely Borsokian folk song, which has been passed down from generator to generator, but it keeps coming back. <laughs> the words are lovely, very nice, very nice, and most poetic and meaningful, so I will translate it to English for you, Mr. Sir. Borsokia, credit vanya gula pranila. This land is wonderful, this land is great, so what is with this high mortgage rate? <laughs> I wandered through the meadows, through fields and through lakes. I wish I could stop, but my car has no brakes. That is a new verse. I do not know the words. That is Borsokian jazz. 
He sings, roses, they are red, violets, they are blue. Back home, lady, we have a cow that looks just like you. <laughs> the Cossacks, they come to loot and to pillage. To me, it's okay, it wasn't my village. <laughs> okay, big ending now. Ta -ta. The end. <laughs> Hi, sports fans. I've got some bad news and some good news about hockey superstar Big Bobby Clobber. Just minutes ago, Bobby was coming up to our broadcast booth here for the interview, and the bad news is this. As Bobby was walking upstairs, his skate slipped, Bobby went flying, and he smashed his head right through our desk. The good news is the desk can be repaired. And Bobby's here with me right now, so first of all, hi, Big Bobby. Hi there, Jim. I'm sorry about the top of your desk. They don't make marble as strong like they used to. Well, that's okay, Big Bobby, as long as you're feeling all right. Well, I, I sure, Big Jim. I feel fine. Ah, oh, good. I'm glad you were wearing your helmet. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Big Jim. My helmet keeps my head safe, and I really enjoy the disco music, too. Wait, 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 wait a second, Bob. Music? What's that, Big Jim? I said I can't hear any music. Neither can I anymore. Oh, good. Well, that's a relief. The news is on now. <laughs> this uh, isn't just an ordinary helmet, Big Jim. This is my official Bobby Clobber Stereo Head Protector and Personal Entertainment Center Hockey Helmet. Oh. By golly, did you wear that during the games? Yeah, you can tune in the play-by-play -play and find out who's got the puck. <laughs> wow, that must be pretty exciting, Bobby. I guess you can even hear yourself score. No, I only wear it when I'm playing hockey. <laughs> Bobby, can you tell us how the official Bobby Clover helmet got started? Like, uh, did you invent it? Well, sort of. Like, I was in the penalty box, like, with uh, nothing to do. And, uh, like, it was a two-minuter for high sticking. And, uh, like, I was, uh, you know, I sat there thinking and thinking and, uh, like, for about 15 minutes. And uh, all of a sudden, it hit me. The idea? No, the coach threw a radio at me. <laughs> I see, and that's what gave you the idea for the hockey helmet. Well, not really, Big Jim. Uh, where the radio was actually aimed on me, I'd have to say the first idea I got was for an official Bobby Clobber musical jock strap. <laughs> but a toy company said it wouldn't sell. I guess it'd be embarrassing if you wanted to change stations in public. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, unless maybe if you were a baseball player, it wouldn't be uh, so embarrassing. Yeah, let me ask you, Bobby, uh, how many helmets have you sold so far? Oh, let me think about that for a minute, Big Jim. I got to think about the sales figures on that. Let's see, there was, uh, we had it uh, over in, uh, we were in Vancouver, so we had a... Uh, uh, then it was uh, Boston, uh, it was uh, Mont oh, it Montreal, uh, one. Wow. Uh, by any chance, is that the one you're wearing? Oh, no, this is a freebie. <laughs> My mom bought the one we sold. Well, okay, Big Bobby, uh, I think that after seeing the way that your official Bobby Clobber hockey helmet radio protected your head when you crashed into that marble desk of ours just a few minutes ago, I'm sure a lot of the youngsters will want to really rush out and buy one. Well, what would a kid want with a marble desk? No, no, no. I, I mean, like, wouldn't it be a, a great thing for you if all the youngsters listening in right now went out and got your hockey helmet? No way, I'm going to keep mine. Let the, <laughs> the little buggers go get their own. Thank you very much. Big Bobby Club. <laughs> Hello? Hello? 
Is this the man and or woman of the house? Yes, it is. Good. And how are we today? Fine. And what charity are you calling for? Uh, my name is Shane, and I'm phoning mm -hmm. you on behalf of the needy in Somalia. Are you familiar with the situation in Somalia? Yes, I am. In fact, I gave a huge donation on their behalf just this morning. Did I say Somalia? I meant Yugoslavia. <laughs> oh, well, I don't believe in war. I wouldn't give a penny to anyone involved in war. Jerry's kids really need your help. <laughs> I know. That's why I sent off my generous check yesterday. Your local animal shelter can't survive without your support. You know. I mean, a small gift of $25 or more would provide Fluffy with a permanent home, keeping him from becoming street pizza. I'm allergic to cats. All right, for $12, we can have him varnished. No, thank you. We're cleaning carpets in your area this week. We've got a special, you, you might like We to... have hardwood floors. You're not going to give me anything, are you? Mm-mm, not a thing. Then why are you talking so nice to me? Oh, it's my training. In fact, if you give me your address, I'll come over to your home and we can discuss why faith and family values in the 90s have been eroded. No, 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 no Even really. for a small no, donation, no, I can give no, you a little no, booklet no, with no, cartoon no, drawings no, and explain our beliefs. No, I can bring lots of my friends. Oh, Dr. Willoughby, do come in. Hello, Dr. Riley, how are you? Oh, as well as can be expected, thank you, Dr. Willoughby, how are you? Well, we'll soon find out. <clears throat> it's time for us to give each other our annual checkup. Oh, that's right, Dr. Willoughby, it is, yes. yes. Well, now, uh, will you strip to your underpants, please? Certainly, Dr. Riley. Would you strip to your underpants, please? Oh, of course. Mm. Oh, interesting. Mm. Oh. oh, very nice. Leopard skin bikini. Yes. Mm. Mm. Uh, now then, Dr. Willoughby, any problems since your last checkup? Oh, not really, Dr. Riley. You? Well, a uh, touch of the gastrics occasionally. Uh, breathe in, would you? Right. Dr. Riley, would you breathe in, please? Oh, certainly. <laughs> All right, you can breathe out now. Oh, oh. Ah, thank you. That's better. <laughs> now then, I, I think what we... Uh, uh, what, what is it? What is it? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Willoughby. You can breathe out now. Oh. <laughs> Beg your pardon. Sorry about that. Uh, now then, Dr. Willoughby, let's see how limber you are. Uh, face me, bend over, and touch your toes. Certainly, Dr. Riley. Would you face me, bend over, touch your toes, please? Oh, of course. <laughs> Well, uh, your skull's all right, but your eyes are crossed. Hmm. Uh, all right, now, Dr. Willoughby, I'd uh, like you to take this little bottle and uh, just go behind that screen, would you? Certainly, Dr. Riley. Would you take this bottle and go behind the other screen, please? Oh, naturally. There's no other way, is there? Uh, so, do you have any, uh, any difficulty in um, Oh, no. It? No, no, none at all. In fact, I'm glad I brought a second bottle with me. <laughs> Tell me, since your last checkup, have you experienced any difficulty in filling the, uh, uh, you know? Only once. When? Right now. Oh, well, in that case, oh, we... hold it. Oh. oh, I lie. <laughs> oh, good. Very good, Dr. Willoughby. Here's mine. Thank you, Dr. Riley. Here's mine. Thank you. Lochheim. Cheers. <laughs> All right, now, um... Now, Dr. Willoughby, I'm, uh, I'm just going to hold you here. Oh, right. And I'm going to hold you here. <laughs> Fine. Now, now cough. cough. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> what? What? Oh. Ha! Caught you. Oh, uh, hello, dear. Mm. At last, I've got grounds for divorce. Uh, oh, uh, but, Teresa, darling, you don't understand. Dr. Willoughby and I are, 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 are simply carrying out our professional duties. Oh, your husband's right, Mrs. Riley. Sure, sure, a likely story. But uh, why would you doubt us, dear? We are, after all, both doctors. Yes. Very well, I'm prepared to listen to your excuse. But explain why a doctor of philosophy and a doctor of literature are cavorting around in your underpants. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, let's see. This is Charnecki, apartment 4D. Yes, who is it? Uh, it's the Fuller Brush Salesman, ma'am. Okay. Not today. Shop. The tailoring shop. Yeah. So that's it. What's the hostage look like, Harris? <laughs> well, he's got a sort of completely bald head, expressionless white face, <laughs> and one very thin leg. <laughs> Does he have a partly stitched jacket pinned to him? That's him! Yeah! <laughs> that's a dummy! I don't care how stupid he is! One move by you and he's gonna get his! Harris, this is the third time this month you've pulled this! And I'll keep doing it every time someone takes my glasses! All right, let's solve it the usual way. How? Put your hands on top of your head. Right? What do you feel? Sort of two circular things joined by wire! <laughs> Do the two circular things joined by wire feel like they've got glass in them? Yes, yes, yes they do, yes. Two pieces of glass, yes. Well, slowly lower them over your face. Right, right, right. Now then. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, that's much better. Much better one. So will you please come out? Yes, all right. I'm sorry. Sorry about that one. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Silly of me. I, uh, I hope there won't be any repercussions, uh, Wooden. This time, I'm afraid there will be, Harris. You're finished. It's guards like you who give prisons a bad name. <laughs> Good morning, Apex Jigsaw Puzzles. Hello, this is uh, Kitty World Toy Town Stores. Uh, we'd like to order 20 dozen of your easy jigsaw puzzles for kids aged 3 to 6. Okay, which one would you want? The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Delivery tomorrow. Okay, and oh, uh, before you go, I, I hear you got a, a dirty puzzle. You know, I mean like <laughs> a, an adult <laughs> puzzle there. That's only for our special customers. We call it Thunder Bay in the Fall. <laughs> oh yeah, well, well, like I heard it's an orgy. Will you shut up? The picture on the cover is Thunder Bay in the fall. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, gotcha. And I'll send you one. Right. 
Okay, I done the deliveries, Mr. Fensterwald. Anything more to go? Yeah, Kitty World Toy Town stores want 12 Texas Chainsaw Massacres. Oh, and one of the orgy. Boy, the taste of kids these days. No, 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 no. The, the staff want the orgy. Oh. I got one orgy puzzle here under the counter. Hey, it's gone. Well, what's it look like? The cover had a picture of lakes and trees. Oh, oh, yeah, I saw that one. I delivered it to the bay. The bay? You mean the department store? Yeah. Oh, no. Don't worry, mister. I looked at the picture. If there's an orgy going on in those trees, you can't see it. You <laughs> idiot. The picture is only on the outside of the box. The puzzle inside the box is an orgy. Oh, oh heaven knows who's got it now. Well, now that dinner's over, would you like to help me do my latest jigsaw puzzle? Oh. Oh, that sounds absolutely delightful, Archbishop. <laughs> That's very good of you, Mother Superior. Here we are. Thunder Bay in the fall. Oh, I do like to see nature in the raw. <laughs> Here we are. My. Now, how do you like to start? From the corners? No, no, I like to start in the middle and then find something I recognize and then work out from there. Well, let's look. Do you see anything you recognize? Well, oh, this piece looks vaguely familiar. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Could it be... No, no, no. What? No, no, my eyes are playing tits. Tricks! <laughs> Now, what's on the picture on the box? Well, well, there's lots of bushes. <laughs> then let's see if we can find some bushes. Yes, well, oh, um, here's one. And here's another. Oh, and another. And another. Oh, and uh, here are two close together. <laughs> All right, let's see what fits, shall we? All right, we? well, now... Now, that looks like, like it goes in, in there. Hmm? And that looks like it goes in there. Yes. Oh, and that, um, there. Which gives us a... Oh, oh tut, dear. tut, Archbishop. Oh. Sin lies in the eye of the beholder. Oh. Now, when we put it all together, we'll see that it's not what you think it is. Yes, I suppose so, Mother Superior. No, exactly. Now, now this bit fits here. Hmm? And, and this in here? What? And, uh, <laughs> voila! Ooh. Oh. <laughs> oh, come now, sister. Remember what you said. Of course, you're right. Now, where does this tree go? <laughs> um. In, in there? Surely not. <laughs> well, and the only possible place for this is, is, is here. Mother Superior. And I don't think there's any doubt left what this is. No, you're right. There's at least nine commandments being broken right yes. there. Nine? Oh, that isn't what I thought it was. Make that ten. Yes. Well, it certainly isn't Thunder Bay in the fall. You know, they've put the wrong jigsaw puzzle into this box. Yes, but can't you see what it is? What? Look at it upside down. Hmm? The entwined bodies. Yes. The Botticellian shapes. Oh. Haven't you seen that before? But of course! Yes. Oh. This is the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican! Yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's been some time since we talked to Professor Wombat of the National Research Council. Professor Hieronymus Wombat! Hieronymus Wombat! Say it! Uh, Hieronymus Wombat. Oh, it's a beautiful name. Yes. Now, <laughs> Professor, the last time we talked, you were teaching turnips to fly. Is that right? Of course. Yes. Uh, how did those experiments turn out? Did you ever get one airborne? Uh, for short periods, yes. One fascinating property of turnip flight is that they don't fly up, only down. <laughs> So the flying turnips were a complete disaster. Uh, not completely, but a little roast turkey, they were delicious. <laughs> but they never really learned how to fly. Uh, no. Any guesses as to why? I am a scientist. I do not make guesses. I can tell you exactly why they never learned to fly. And why is that? 
It is because they're stupid. <laughs> There's no vegetable more stupid on the face of the earth or in it than that round yellow ticketed dummy of a turnip. Really, Professor? They're all exactly. They're vegetables. <laughs> Professor Wombat, can you tell us what you're working on now? Yeah, yeah. This is a much more promising experiment because the participants are intelligent. I see. I am now working with lettuce. <laughs> you're working with lettuce? Oh, such a change. Nice, bright, happy, smart lettuce. What are you doing with the lettuce? I am teaching the lettuce to walk. <laughs> uh, Professor, could you describe what you're doing then for the home audience? Yeah, yeah. Well, first I select a ripe, crisp head of lettuce. Then yeah. I place it on the floor. And then I urge it to walk, like so. Come to daddy, my little leafy darling. Come to daddy. Uh, sometimes this approach doesn't work. You see, the lettuce understands me, but he may be in a mood. Oh, um, uh, do you think the microphones are putting him on? Yeah, oh, maybe. Perhaps if I get a little closer to him. Fine. Come on, sweetheart, walk. Come to daddy. There, he moved, he moved. You kicked it. No, I didn't. You did, you kicked it. My foot slipped. It's an old war wound. The Allies gave it to me at Normandy. I twitch. I got no pension. Professor, you're a fraud. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen at home, uh, there's really no point continuing this broadcast. Professor Wombat is obviously a fraud. We're just going to have to end the broadcast early. No, 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 don't stop the show. I just remembered the reason this lettuce can't walk is because I cut off its legs for easy landings. This is a flying lettuce. Come on, Professor. No, it's true. Watch. I pick it up. It flew. It you flew. You threw it against the wall. It leapt out of my hand. You threw it. No, it, it was a kamikaze lettuce. Oh, come on. <laughs> I, I, got, I got tomatoes that wink. Look. Oh, that one doesn't count. Professor. I got an onion that counts to ten. A beetroot that speaks German. Professor. Oh. <laughs> Professor, enough is enough. This is... You invited me here for the scoop of the century, and all I see are lettuce that can't walk, tomatoes that can't wink, onions that don't count, and mute beetroots. Well, this has been a complete waste. Do you have any sour cream? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I do. Oh, then it's not a complete waste. Let's have some borscht. <laughs> Yes, Robert. Mm, how long have we been seeing each other? Counting the time I was married? Two years? Oh, Elaine, it's time we talked about something. Yes, Robert. What is it? Life insurance. Oh, oh Robert? Elaine, darling. Yes. Oh, my company offers a variety of retirement fixed-term investments with guaranteed interest rates. You know something? You really turn me on when you talk insurance. Oh. Tell me more. Well, these investments, these lovely investments, yes. will mature on any date you choose. Just name the date, darling. And we can roll it over into guaranteed investment certificates. Oh, Robert. Hold me tight. Oh, Elaine. Oh, Elaine, I've never seen a policy as beautiful as this one. Robert. Mm. Tell me these funds are redeemable prior to maturity. Oh, yes, darling, yes, just for you. Mm. Robert, mm. you're too kind. <laughs> too kind. Elaine, what is it? What's wrong? I... Uh, I can't go on like this. I have a confession. Oh? Really? There's something you should know. What? Robert, there's another policy. <laughs> Oh, no. Don't blame yourself, Robert. It was my fault. Was it my policy, Elaine? But try to understand. I'm, I'm the kind of woman who needs a lot of coverage. You need the same coverage I do. Women are different, Robert. We need more coverage. Didn't I give you competitive premiums? Yes. Didn't I give you extensive theft and liability? The best, the best, darling. Don't do this to yourself. Oh, why, Elaine? Why? Oh, well, I, I wanted a variety of options. You gave me standard clauses. It was just one of those things, Robert. I'd, I'd had a little wine. Oh, sure. The lighting was romantic. And yeah. before... Robert, honestly, before I knew what I was doing, I'd endorsed the policy. 
Then it's over for us, Elaine? No, Robert, it doesn't have to end. Well, how can I trust you now? Oh. Robert. Robert, there's something else. It's a man. Is he an agent? No. Thank God for that. <laughs> Robert, I've got to leave. We've, we've got a date. I'm coming with you. I want to meet this man face to face. Oh, Robert, you know violence never solved anything? Oh, I know that. But I may be able to sell him a new policy. This is Sergeant Renfrew. When I entered my lonely log cabin on the 14th floor of Mountie headquarters, something seemed unusual. My desk was on fire. I grabbed the two books I'd been reading, Harassment in the Working Place and Arson in the Office, and called the chief. It all fits in, Renfrew, he said. The Grabucci mob is trying to scare you. We've just found his underworld rival, Carlo Zucchini, floating in the river. He's been shot, stabbed, beaten, tortured, and his hair was mussed up. <laughs> we suspect foul play, Renfro. He was moving upstream. <laughs> In no time, my incredible dog Cuddles and I had made our way to a known underworld hideout, Gerbucci's Gambling Protection Real Estate and Loan Shark Office. <laughs> dashed inside and found myself face to chest with an extremely tall secretary. <laughs> she was wearing the lowest cut dress I've ever seen. It came down just below my navel. <laughs> it looked like a necklace with sleeves. <laughs> Could she be hiding something? Tell me what you know about Grabucci's, I demanded. Not here, she whispered. Meet me on the roof in five minutes. I rushed back to my log cabin office, showered, shaved, and in five minutes was up on the roof ready to rendezvous with Miss Blue Eyes. <laughs> Suddenly the door to the roof opened and I found myself staring right into her mustache. Wait, this was no secretary. It was Guido Grabucci himself. All four foot eleven of him. I could tell it was him because of the badge on his pinstripe chest. It read, have a nice day or I'll kill you. He grabbed me by my lapels and slowly raised himself till he was standing on my kneecaps. <laughs> hey, Renfrew, why you bother me? I haven't done nothing to you. He sounded like an undercover Mountie. <laughs> Suddenly, he made me an offer. He offered to push me off the roof. <laughs> I hate pushy people. <laughs> then, before I could throw the cuffs on him, he gave me the slip. I put it on, called Cuddles... <laughs> And I walked right down into Grabucci's Gambling Protection Real Estate and Loan Shark office. I was amazed. I found several people all wearing pinstripe suits. They were stuffing pastries into gambling equipment. Just as I suspected, the gambling business was a front for an illegal bakery. <laughs> Hold the breadsticks, I screamed. They misunderstood. Three women grabbed my right leg and ran east. Three other women grabbed my left leg and ran west. I made a wish. <laughs> It didn't come true. <laughs> when I regained consciousness... <laughs> Gabucci and his gang were packing up their equipment ready to make their getaway. We had to act fast. I picked up banana cream pie and threw it at Gabucci. It hit him right in the face. He was furious. He picked up a custard pie and got me right in the knees. In no time, the food was flying everywhere. It looked like a Ukrainian wedding. <laughs> and suddenly, the criminals all started falling over like tenpins. I couldn't believe it. It was Cuddles. He was up on a catwalk, dropping weak old bread onto their heads. <laughs> As each of them fell over, they landed on a conveyor belt. I don't know where the belt took them, but they're now the only pretzel-shaped criminals in the world. <laughs> Today, the court has sent the Grabucci gang to prison to straighten them out. <laughs> Miss Blue Eyes was acquitted at a non-jury trial presided over by Judge Angelo Grabucci. As for the bakery, it's now an illicit after-hours pool hall, as far as we know. But if you should ever eat a rum ball that tastes like a billiard, give us a call.
excuse me, monsieur, are you the owner of this restaurant? Yes, right, that's me, yeah. Uh, yes, sir, here is my card. I am from the city of Montreal. Oh. Yeah, actually, I am from La Régie de la Langue Française. The what? The Tongue Troopers. Oh, the language police. Uh, call us what you want. The fact is, your menu outside your restaurant is in English. Well, that's what I specialize in, English cuisine, isn't it? <laughs> English cuisine? Yeah. English cuisine? Yeah. Monsieur, there is no such thing. <laughs> The items on your menu sign outside have got to be changed. Today's specials must be changed to Specialité du jour. That's all right, yeah, okay. Which right. brings us to the very first item, bangers and mash. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a very popular English dish, you see. You are going to have to change it to purée de détonation. <laughs> Monsieur, it is not our worry how absurd it is in translation. Hey, come on, if I worried about absurdity, I would not be doing this job. <laughs> okay, now, item number two on your menu. Well, it's toad in the hole. What? Toad in the hole. It's, a, it's an English dish, toad in the hole. Monsieur, this would not be a veiled political comment, would it? <laughs> Toad in the hole must be written as crapaud dans la cavité. You've got to be joking. Crapaud dans la cavité. Who's going to come in here and say, hey, squire, a piece of your crapaud on your cavity, see who's <laughs> Yeah, I assure you, crapaud does not have the same suggestion in French as it might have in English. <laughs> now, the third item on your menu is the one that really worries me. Well, okay, yeah, yeah, I can see that one. But believe me, there really is a dish Monsieur, by that name. Monsieur, that is. mind absolutely boggles. Are you seriously telling me that in England, people actually walk into a restaurant and say, Hello, I will have some of your spotted dick. <laughs> said it's a spongy rail with sultanas in it. Monsieur, boasting will get you nowhere. <laughs> now, let me consult my dictionary. <laughs> Compose yourself, monsieur. Let me consult my dictionary. On your sign outside, it will have to be listed as Richard Taché. I can't put the French sign that says that. I really can't. Monsieur, I am not the one who chooses dishes that sound like bodily functions and rare diseases. How about a bribe? What? A bribe. What makes you think I can be bought? You look like it. I do? Yeah. You know, a bit overweight, sweats too much, shiny suit, frayed at the cuffs. I reckon you look like a prime candidate for a bribe. How about two hundred dollars? Hundred and fifty in the plate of spotted dick. Oh yeah, you got it. Now you're talking. Oh. Hello, nurse. Uh, I'd like to see Dr. Redmond. Uh, Dr. Redmond is dead. He's dead? Well, not actually dead. He's moved to Mississauga. <laughs> Can I help you? Well, I, I suppose you could, but I'd... No, I'd prefer to see the doctor, thanks. I am the doctor. No, no, no. I, I mean the real doctor. <laughs> I am the real doctor. Are you a real man? Oh, hey, hey. hey, listen, I didn't mean to insult you. You know, I, I, I just have to see the doctor about a personal matter. It's personal, you know, very personal as in personal, you know. 
Well, what's the matter? You got intimate itch or something? Look, is there somebody else I can see? Sir, I am a fully qualified medical doctor. I deal with people every day. I am a professional. Oh, okay. Oh, goody. I get to see you naked. I get to see you naked. <laughs> hey, no, no. Forget it. Forget it. Oh, look, I was only kidding. Where's your sense of humor? Look, take off your clothes and I'll examine No, you. no. No, no, that's not... Now, look. No. There is no way I can help you if you will not cooperate. Now, here is a hospital gown. You go behind the dressing screen, get into it, and then we can talk. Okay, you're the doctor. Okay, I got my jacket off. Now, don't feel embarrassed. I am a doctor. Listen, I've got the gown on, but it doesn't fit very well. Do you have one that doesn't gape in the front? You've got it on backwards. Oh. Okay, that's better. I'm ready. Then come out. Well, here I am. Oh, my God. What? What's wrong? What's wrong? I forgot to feed my goldfish this morning. Doctor, you, you, you don't seem to be concentrating. Well, what do you expect? You've got all your clothes on. I, I know. Look, Doc, I'm feeling rather embarrassed. Well, I can see that. A... Uh, would you like a longer gown? Uh, no, but... <laughs> Maybe you could turn the heat up? All I want is to see Dr. Redmond. I, I, not some strange woman who wants to do Lord knows what with a stethoscope. This is really embarrassing. Look, I am a doctor. Why should you be embarrassed with me and not Dr. Redmond? Because it's not your income tax. I came here to audit. <laughs> yes, it's time once again for that hostess with the mostess, the queen of the kitchen, the duchess of dining, here she is, Amy de la Pompa. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. So, Amy, we're going to talk about cooking today. Uh, tell me, my dear, how did you acquire your bent in the kitchen? Well, I was in the kitchen leaning over the pot of fur when this sumo wrestler positively threw himself on me. Uh, 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 Amy, I, I think we should leave this for another time. Which is exactly what I said to him, Bernard. I said, put on a pair of pants that don't disappear up your buttocks and we'll have lunch. <laughs> My uh, question, Amy, was actually, how did you acquire your knowledge of cuisine? From my third husband, Rudolfo. He was a chef. Oh, and what a chef. The Pope of Escalope, the Tsar of Vichyssoise, a positive wizard of the sautéed gizzard. <laughs> he was a, a keen cook, I gather. Keen bird, keen. He was so keen, he had a kitchen range in the bedroom. <laughs> uh, did he use a moulinex? Oh, good gracious, no. He was a devout Catholic. <laughs> Uh, no, no, Amy. Uh, a Moulinex is a food processor. Oh, really? I wondered why consumers distributing were advertising them with a range of attachments. <laughs> no, no, Rudolfo never used a blender. When he expressed a desire for shake and bake, I never knew whether to get out a plastic bag or sluice some perfume down my cleavage. <laughs> Or both. <laughs> In one very confusing evening, we hid chicken a la Chanel and I had to vacuum the stuffing out of my bra. My goodness, Amy, you, you should have settled for a clubhouse. Well, that's exactly where it happened, Bernard. And you know, we've never been invited back to that club again. I'm not surprised. Well, Amy, uh, let's get to the practical side of cooking. Uh, Amy, how would you prepare an exotic dish? And uh, we have some questions from our listeners here. Uh, one question. Amy, how would you prepare frog's legs? Oh, talk not to me of frog's legs, Bernard. They caused me tragedy. Geraldo, my fourth husband, would eat nothing else, and it led to his end. Good heavens, they poisoned him? No. One evening he ate 118 frog's legs and subsequently hopped himself into a delirium. And what did you do? Duck. He was all over the room. 
until he found the window, Bernard. Oh, and he went through it? Yes, he couldn't resist wrapping his tongue around a passing fly. My goodness, he turned into an insectivora. Oh, no, he was a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> and he caught the fly in his mouth, much to the consternation of the angler on the end of whose line the said fly was attached. Tragic, Amy. Oh, tragic. tragic, Bernard. You don't know the meaning of the word until you've seen your loved one zizzed into a lily pond at the end of a fishing magician. I was there when he hopped out, you know, and I held him in my arms. What a moving moment. <laughs> Try not to laugh, Amy. It's a moving moment and very near the end. So there he was. He thought he was a frog. He hopped out of the pond. Yes, I was there when he hopped out and I held him in my arms. What a moving moment. Did he say anything? No, Bernard. It was more emotional than that. Tell me. Sit down, Miss uh... Merkin. <laughs> Merkin, yes. And welcome to Bell Telephone. Thank you. Is that Merkin with a C or a K? Yes. <laughs> well, what exactly is the problem? Well, um, I've been getting telephone calls lately. On my telephone? <laughs> what kind of telephone calls? Well, they're dirty. <laughs> Obscene? Yes. <laughs> Filthy? Yes. <laughs> Without any redeeming social merit whatsoever? I don't think so. <laughs> well, I'm glad you came to us, Miss Merkin, because if there's any filth going around, we at Bell Telephone want to be the first to hear it. <laughs> Do they come at any specific time? Oh, uh, yes, every night at 10 o'clock when I'm having my bath, except on Sunday. He never calls on Sunday. Possibly a religious man. <laughs> All right, now you're in the bathtub. Then what happens? Well, the telephone rings. Yes, yes. I leap out of the water, charge down the hall, and pick up the phone. I like to get it in the first ring. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then what happens? Well, he just breathes a lot. <laughs> breathe? A sort a of, uh... uh... No, not exactly. He, uh, he put more into it. <laughs> I see, a sort of, uh... <gasps> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> How long does this breathing go on for? Oh, uh, about 20 minutes. <laughs> I see, and after 20 minutes of... Does he say anything? Yes. What? Oh, I can't. It's too horrible. All right, then you don't need well, to... Well, actually, he says, I stroke your silky thighs. <laughs> I stroke your silky thighs? That's what he says. I was just repeating. <laughs> Then let me recap. It's 10 o'clock and you're in your bath caressing your silky thighs. <laughs> when suddenly the telephone goes, you charge down the hallway, pick up the phone in your wet hand and stand there stark naked while you hear... 
Mm. A little higher. I stroke your silky thighs. Well, uh, not exactly, no. What's wrong? Well, uh, he puts more into it. Well, I'm sure he would. No, no. I mean, he gives it all he's got. Well, so did I. Oh, you poor man. <laughs> Look, is there any peculiarity about his voice? Oh, well, he speaks with an accent. Ah! What kind of accent? Irish. Irish, right. I struck your shirty thighs! Well, you know, he talks kind of funny. Well, that's not exactly normal, is it? No, uh, well, what I mean is he's hunched over the phone to one side and... Hunch? Yes. Like this? Uh, no, the other side. Like this? Yes, and he's cross-eyed. <laughs> oh, and he talks with a lisp. I just remembered. A lisp. I see. A hunchbacked religious cross-eyed Irishman with a speech impediment. <laughs> I think we're narrowing the field down, Miss Merkin. Cross the eyes a little more. Uh, I'll let the tongue drool. Uh, have more of a drool than a dribble. Now, bring it down. Oh, oh, that's perfect. What are you doing Sunday night? <laughs>